I'm Kira Colburn, Head of Platform at Workbench. And for those of you who don't know Workbench, we invest in startups building enterprise software at the seed stage, and we have spent the past 10 years building a dynamic enterprise community here in New York City. And I run all of our events and community platforms, so including these master classes, our New York Enterprise Tech Meetup here in New York, which our next one will be, I believe, April 16th. So look out for an invite in your email soon for that. Our Women Enterprise events and hundreds of other events throughout the year. And as seed investors, we work closely with our founders on all things go to market, and we are actively investing in technical founders and products, including companies like Cockroach Labs, Authzed, Streamdolls, uh, AppMap, and many others. So we know as many technical founders are thinking through the sales cycle, and there are many unique nuances around selling a technical product to technical buyers. And that's why we're very excited today to have Kieran Nassau with us. He's our Workbench sales advisor, and he will be leading our masterclass. And Kieran has over 25 years of sales experience, ranging from startups to some of the largest global tech companies. And he's worked with a number of our early stage founders here at Workbench and developer products and tools to launch their sales motions. So he's led multiple master classes before. I'll drop some of the links in the chat in just a second on discovery and demoing, qualifying leads, forecasting, et cetera. But today he's going to go over the five stages of um, critical for founders to technical founders to master across sales. So messaging, discovery, org mapping, demoing, enterprise readiness, and all of that good stuff. So with that, Kieran, I'll hand it on over to you and let you screen share. All right. Thank you very much for the intro and to the entire Workbench team for hosting these. Can you guys see uh, the screen and hear me all right? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, again, thank you everybody on the Workbench team and thanks everyone on this call for joining. I hope this is a, a helpful session. Uh, these are my opinions, so please feel free to disagree with them loudly if need be. Uh, but uh, my objective here is to share some insights that I think can be very helpful for you as you think through and, and build out your go-to-market machinery, uh, especially as it relates to selling to larger, uh, larger enterprises. So who is this for? Why are we here? Uh, obviously, you're all here. Most of you uh, saw the registration list, uh, list are early stage founders or leaders in, in, in a startup selling a more technical product. Uh, increasingly you're selling it to enterprises. And I want to be very uh, you know, uh, uh, generous about the term enterprises because a lot of the things that have been happening in this post zero interest rate um, uh, world are companies are, and many of you on this call are seeing this live play out. Uh, they're being a lot more careful about how they spend their money. Uh, they're being a lot more circumspect about looking at vendor tools. They're looking at more of them there um, uh, more stakeholders have to say yes in order to make a decision. Um, and more often than not, the signature and the sign off for the spend has to happen at a much higher level than it had to even a couple of years ago. And um, the reason I call out enterprise is that that's kind of how those of us who have been selling enterprises have had to sell anyway for the last 20 plus years. Uh, so you know, it's somewhat of a back to the future moment for us and that, you know, we certainly have been here before. So today, really what we want to, whoops, what we really want to talk about are what are some of the things uh, that we can do to up our game and to maximize our win rates in an environment that is that is complicated and is further compounded by the fact that we're selling a technical product and it, and, and it has technical buyers, but it also has business outcomes and business benefits. And as my old friend, Socrates used to say, I don't think he actually said this, but I'd love to picture him as saying it, is that even technical products have business benefits, meaning um, we might sell a product that really impacts some esoteric aspect of the developer sort of day-to-day -day experience, but trust me, there's a business benefit that we can tease out of that. And I want to talk a little bit about how we can do that. So, so really the broad tactics are really strong and effective and relevant messaging and getting crisp on why your product really exists in the space and, and what problems you're solving in a unique way. Nailing our first meetings so that we can really set the stage for uh, an effective sales cycle and, and a win. Um, 
effectively building out an org map and an understanding of the stakeholders that you have to win over so that you can identify gaps and accelerate the deal cycle, um, making better and more more explicit and ex you know exploitative use of your demo assets to actually set yourselves up to win the deal as distinct from just showing sort of all the aspects of your product. And lastly, enterprise readiness, which is really about anticipating some of the roadblocks you're going to be running into during the sales cycle and being ready on a lot of different fronts to be able to deal uh, with those. So let's let's kind of dive in. Um, so number one, I want to talk a little bit about messaging. And ultimately, and those, those of you who know me know I get on my soapbox about this uh, topic quite often um, and <laughs> for good reason. I think, look, this is the core. We started, you started your company to solve a specific problem. If you, if you are effective at telling why you exist, what problems you solve, why those problems are critical for those target users or personas to solve, and why you can do it better than others, and establishing some level of proof behind that, you're, you're a significant uh, portion of the way there to, 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 to really building a, a very successful company. On top of that, we have to understand that specifically to technical with technical products sold to technical audiences, we have to be aware that sometimes a technical buyer is going to be right there with you in the weeds at the most basic granular level of what your product does. And that person may be critical to the sale, but there'll also be people who are less able to fully understand and appreciate the nuances of everything your product does, but who may be equally critical in winning over in order to get the sale over the line. And we have to know who those people are as early as possible. So coupled with a very strong messaging framework is a very strong ICP framework that allows us to say, we know the characteristics of the companies that have these challenges. We know the roles and personas and titles of the people who are likely to be res responsive and need these sorts of capabilities. And we know characteristics of companies that we could put into a system like PitchBook or ZoomInfo or whatever so that we can find those organizations. I'll call that ICP mapping, which is sort of a broader part of this messaging uh, framework. But I think the important piece to, to note is that we have to think about the business outcomes even in ways that engineers care about, or in ways that engineers bosses bosses, maybe somebody who runs platform uh, engineering or whatever the title, maybe even a CISO for selling into the security space or into the AppSec space. So that these messages are done on a persona ba per persona basis. Yeah, there's some work here, uh, but uh, that it's very specifically speaking the language of those individuals so that when we speak with them, we're speaking not at a level too deep or not at a level too shallow, but at the right sort of Goldilocks uh, point. So, and again, not being afraid of sort of weaving in business outcomes, even for those technically focused personas, because those those are there. And many of you that I work with on this call have done a really good job at teasing, um, teasing those out. So once we've sort of gotten that down, let's kind of go on to sort of part two. Uh, and again, those of you who know me know I get on a soapbox about uh, really nailing our first meetings because it is the it is the sort of the tip of the spear of our sales effort. Um, and a big core element of nailing this is preparation. So when I talk about preparation, what I talk one of the one of the things that you may run into if you've got a website that has click here to get a demo. Um, Many companies I work with are struggling with, oh, I got a demo that got booked in three hours. We got to change that. We've got to build in a little bit of a buffer between the time that the meeting gets booked and the meeting gets held to give you or your team time to do this research. So what is the research? How did the lead come to us? Did they ask about a demo? Did we get to them? Um, did they respond to an event or download something and raise their hand? Like, how did they come to us? What is their role? What do we know about their company? What do we know about other roles in the company? Do they fit the target ICP that we want to sell to, at least that we've defined? Um, are they showing the characteristics that make them a likely good consumer of our product? Is the individual that's reaching out, is he or she one of the people that we would, if we were choosing to reach out, that we would 
that we would reach out to, or are they more of a junior woodchuck in the organization? We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, so this is really critical because if we know who we came, who came in, how they got here, what signals we can glean from the company and the other people in the organization, a couple of good things happen. One, we can get to the meeting and be a little bit more relevant in terms of articulating capabilities, but understanding what they're looking for. But also in laying the groundwork on playing the game of hop and, hop and skip to get to the other stakeholders if the person we're starting with ends up being junior. It's a lot easier to go, oh, I see that you, uh, uh, Jane Smith is a head of SRE over there. Um, we've actually worked with her, blah, 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 in another place. Now all of a sudden you're, starting the multi-stakeholder engagement literally before the meeting. So uh, I can't emphasize enough sort of the, the preparation work and really getting this down so that when you arrive at the meeting, you're in, in sort of a, in a good capacity to sort of execute. The second thing I want to talk about is how to run the meeting itself. Um, I'm going to say something very controversial and heads might explode, but I strongly urge uh, those selling technical products to technical buyers not to lead with a demo. In fact, I would argue that the first meeting should be a 15 to 30 minute, let's get to know each other session. Uh, you, want to, you want to show respect for their time. You also want to show respect for your time because not every uh, prospect is a match, not every prospect is a fit. So how do we quickly assess who we're dealing with, what problems they're having, why they reached out, what interest areas they have and where they wanna go, what problems they're trying to solve with this technology, as well as rough ideas of their timing and urgencies and priorities. So if you can structure a first meeting without the demo and be upfront about it, just say, look, I, I wasn't planning to show you the product. I think it's better if I understand a little bit more about what problems you're trying to solve to see if we're even a good match for you. And if we are, I'd love to take you through the product in much more detail. You will earn some knowledge that will allow you to make for a better demo later because it will be more impactful to them, more specific to their requirements and less quote unquote generic, um, which will likely more, uh, you know, more frequently convert into a, a later stage opportunity. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all these things, but the broad three parts are laying out an agenda, even if it takes 30 seconds, like, hey, thanks for joining. Uh, here are the things I was hoping we'd accomplish in this call. How does that sound? Takes 30 seconds and you're done. A little bit of intros. If there's more than one stakeholder that you're aware of, get a little bit of background of them. Um, that first 10 minutes is critical because you want to establish a level of rapport. So good curious questions like, hey, how did you get us? How did you find us? What are some of the areas that you want to dig into during the session? Um, sharing a relevant vignette around proof points about how you helped XYZ company, ideally somebody similar to them, uh, is a great setup. And then when we get into the core, a good segue is, so let's dig into some of the things you talked about uh, a few minutes ago, Mr. and Ms. Prospect, and then sort of run the meeting there. And by the way, this is just my, my proposal that you can shorten it, you can lengthen it, but fundamentally, we want to we want to show respect for their time and run the meeting well, watching the clock, so that if there's 10 minutes left in the time, we give ourselves ample time to summarize what we heard, uh, qualify, say, hey, look, I think we can solve your, your challenges. I'd love to know a little bit more about some of the other folks who'd be involved in this evaluation. Um, let's go ahead and get that next meeting on the calendar and literally do that. But then also make a request of, hey, can we, can we, can we block a little time, uh, maybe a couple of days before the demo? I'd love to just run through what I'm planning to show you guys and make sure it's, it's on point with the team that's going to attend. Most people will respect that and respond favorably to that. And then lastly, try not to talk more than 30, 40% of the time. It's, believe me, it's not easy. I'm, I'm doing all the talking here, so I'm one to talk. But the point is, is that we really need to be listening with both ears because when we're, and a lot of times we're in sales meetings, we're either speaking or preparing to speak. And in neither of those cases are we effectively listening very actively. And when, I, when we're actively listening, we will hear clues that buyers, they, if they're in pain, if they're trying to solve a problem and they're very curious about whether you can solve it, they're going to drop clues. And we just have to know to pull at those threads and ask for clarification or if they could expand on something they said. 
And you can't do that if you're talking, 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 and demoing, demoing, demoing. So that's the other reason why I think it's it's very important. Um, and the last last point, uh, many of the founders I'm working with have started to incorporate conversation intelligence or recording tools. I strongly urge it. Sure, some enterprises will push back, but if you can build a library of those first meetings and, and really tag them and, and go back to them, you can start to tease out the stuff that works really well so that you can also train future non-founder sellers that come down the road. All right. Um, Quick question. Yeah, sure. Someone asked in the chat, uh, what do you do if a customer pushes for the demo in the first meeting? Do you deflect it or you go into it? I assume this person has, uh, that that's happened to them in the past. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably happened to literally everyone on this call, including me many times. Um, and the short answer is it's you're going to have to make a judgment call. I think uh, if you feel you're dealing with a senior le level enough person, you've heard the right urgency signals like, oh, they, these guys are actively in a project. We need to move quickly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you think that this is likely a buyer that sounds like you've got some pain and you want to give them a small taste of certain elements of the product, be my guest, do so. But I still think that... Um, Having it to be having a demo that's set up to be more specific and relevant and impactful to that buyer's specific needs is is a, a better use of the time. A lot of the other reason I push back is a lot of the demos that I've seen founders do are kind of more like training sessions. Let me show you everything about the product, regardless of whether it directly impacts the the person's life on the other end of the line, and. Because of that, because you know we have to establish a discipline and a rig around demos in and of themselves, I advise minimizing the, the, the time doing that until you really feel you're ready. Um, yeah, let me let me carry on from that and we can we can certainly uh, we'll have time later to talk a little bit more. Uh, somebody also raised their hand, um, but I'm not looking at the chat. Uh, was there another question, uh, Kira, that I should answer before I go on? Um, I, yeah, I saw someone raise their hand too, but if whoever that is wants to put their question in the chat, we'll, um, we'll get to it throughout. So, uh, nothing cool. right now and keep on going. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, with respect to, um, enterprises, whether you're selling a technical product or not, but especially when you're selling a technical product, the, the, the the key fundamental thing that we all have to keep in mind as enterprises and and really even large mid market companies you know thousand whatever employees or or more have to buy by consensus going back to the point I made at the beginning of the meeting uh, that consensus uh, could be pretty broad it depends on the nature of the product you're you're selling and it depends on the audiences that are going to use that product but it could end up having um, senior executive decision makers, technical buyers, technical influencers, uh, business recommenders or influencers. And generally speaking, when we enter into a conversation with a new prospect, all we know is what we've uncovered in our research. All we know is the individual who's requested the meeting. We might have done some LinkedIn research to see where they stack in the organization. Ideally in our prep, we've done LinkedIn research to find out who are the other, like if we're selling to SREs, who, how many SREs are at this company? How many people in platform engineering title at this company? Are there any VP level people? If those are the audiences we've got to win over, let's build an early viewpoint on how many of them they are so that we can enter into that first meeting knowing who to ask for in terms of getting in front of other people. And we also, if we know we've sold to those types of organizations and who has the power to buy, we can kind of make a judgment as to how far down sort of the pike these people are. So this is an internal facing asset I recommend we we build. It's gonna have one box in the first meeting, but maybe by the second or third meeting when we've had a broader set of demos and, and workshops with other, with other buyers, we may start to fill this out. And the metadata around these boxes is as important as the names and who they report to. The metadata I think is important that we need to track are things like, do they like our product or do they like our com competition's product? Do they, you know, are they easy for us to get in front of? Have we met them before? What is their likely involvement and role in the decision to eventually purchase this product? And, you know, I'll, I'm going to talk about what I mean by champion, but are they actively championing, 
championing our cause inside the organization. So, so uh, in fact, there's some tools you can get at HubSpot at Salesforce where you can, it'll auto draw the chart and allow you to layer on this metadata as well. So you don't have to make it a, you know, a painful PowerPoint exercise. Uh, but I, for those of you who are interested, I built a Google Sheets template and I'm happy to share it with anyone who's interested. Just uh, let us know in the chat. So, um, Wait, yeah. quick question on the org mapping someone asked. Yeah. Um, how do you learn all of this org information? Is it something you dig into on the <clears throat> discovery call? I think uh, I, there's a few ways to do it. And again, this is not a thing that you're going to get. You're not going to fill it out on day one. You might come to the first meeting, found out that uh, the person you're talking with is Ehrlich Bachman. Uh, and <laughs> my, my sympathies if that is the first person you get to. But uh, you might get to that person. But hopefully you did the LinkedIn research to realize that um, there is a CISO. Uh, there is a, a CTO and there's a few senior VPs in engineering and you know that that's there because A, maybe there's a leadership page, B, you found them on LinkedIn. So you've started to build this almost like a dossier of the people you know you're going to eventually need to get to. And if you're dealing with the juniorist woodchuck in the organization, like in this case, Ehrlich, you, you, you're empowered by knowing those names because I've done this before many times where you say, hey, I know that uh, so-and-so is uh, VP of engineering. How do you uh, collaborate with him or her? Um, now, all of a sudden, the prospect is like, oh, this person's done the research. And they're, they may not know who you do or don't now know. So they're usually going to be more open about sharing names. So A, part A is try to assemble the research yourself using LinkedIn and other tools. B, be open about asking. Who else is likely to be involved in if you guys decide you need to, to spend money on this capability? And more times than not, you'll probably get the answer. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, those of you who know me also know I get in my soapbox about champions and, and champions are verbs, not just nouns, um, meaning they are actually taking steps actively day in and day out to promote our our product over, in many cases, the, the other alternatives that the customer might have uh, for a given solution. That doesn't happen automatically. We've got to nurture them, right? So a big aspect of winning them over is, A, are we dealing with the right person in the beginning? Is this person influential in the decision? And that comes from knowing the org, but also knowing typically who we're likely to be bought through meaning or or you know pulled in if you will and if you're newer you may not have a lot of that stuff nailed out yet and that's okay we you know we live and we learn through every every sort of day-to-day -day interaction we have with prospects but if you believe that you're dealing with somebody who can pull you in and, and actually make stuff happen then do everything you can to win them over give them thought leadership and other education get them connected with other you know customers in the community whatever it might make makes sense to do get them you know connected with your founder if you're not the if the founder is not the one doing the sales um, anything you can to win them over because the right champion can be a force multiplier inside the organization because remember most of the buying decisions happen behind their walls you can't be there for every meeting so you've got to find ways to win over people who can represent your best you know position when you're not in the room which is 90 percent of the time or more so uh, it's a very important aspect of of really solidifying your foundation within a given opportunity within a given within a given customer um, and again just some quick tips start early uh, as i said earlier before the first meeting ideally use linkedin whatever tools you can right um, there are some great resources out there and if, if you guys ping me later i can share with you uh, What's the typical technology organization look like these days? By industry, it's going to be different, of course. But if you sell the banking and insurance versus, you know, healthcare oriented organizations. But knowing what that organization looks like in the abstract is very helpful for you to know, OK, now specifically to this prospect, here's what it's likely to, to look at. And like I said earlier, a few minutes ago, don't be shy about mentioning the names you've uncovered in your research. It looks like you're organized. You've got your act together and you're you're. You, you know, you really want to work with the company. So that's, that always usually sends uh, good signals. But the, the best scenario is start high. It's not always going to work. I can say that as much as I want, but uh, let's face it, it's not always going to work. So we've got to find ways to know how to leap 
into different senior levels through this additional kind of this early groundwork. Um, I'm going to segue into something that is very near and dear to my heart and something I've been practicing and preaching for literally decades, and that is really nailing the demo and the impact of the demo. Um, yes, what I said earlier, not a lot of you will agree um, with respect to demoing, not on the first meeting. Again, every company is different, but one thing I will say is that the demos that I see are too long. They, you know, we show our product way too soon before we've learned why the customer is even talking to us. Um, and I won't go through all these because it'll take me a long time, but, but we tend to think of the product as this, this amorphous whole, when in reality, it may solve the problem in very specific, discrete chunks that we, that we don't, that, that we don't um, uh, enunciate well enough. There are also, more often than not, just long soliloquies. Um, and the thing that probably bugs me the most is that we, we often take a product out way of showing the, the, the product, meaning if you watch a demo, sometimes it, it looks like we're training them on the product because we're like, let's show you this panel, then this panel, then this panel, and then click here, and then click there. There's no day in the life fluidity to like how people would actually use it in their lives. So I won't spend any more time on this other than to say, we've got to up our game when we demo. We've, we've just fundamentally got to get to a better place where where we're what I like to say, first and foremost, we've woven in the, pre the the preparation so we can be ready to show the stuff that's relevant and impactful to the buyer in an interactive way that pulls them into the conversation, that uh, answers their questions sort of in flight, and that also seeds questions when it when it's quiet. Um, Respectful in that we're managing the time really well. We're also laying out what we're going to cover, but also noting noting that there are other areas we probably want to dive into, but let's save those for a future conversation. For example, and I'll get into this in more detail, if our product needs implementation or integration, maybe we can have a workshop just on that and that we could focus on business functionality or technical functionality for the buyers that we're selling to, whether it's engineering or CISO or whoever it might be. Um, and then I think the other piece is thinking about your demos from the perspective of how the people in the audience are likely to use it in their day to day after they bought it and it's gone live. That's a lot of you know words to say, don't show the product how you demo it, show the product how buyers that have now deployed it, use it and depend on it day to day. And that subtle difference is going to make a big improvement in the impact that your, your demos have. And I think the other piece I wanna talk a little bit, uh, actually, I'm gonna come back to this. The other piece is that there is no one demo. There might be an overview demo that might take 10 or 15 minutes and it's highly, you know, you've got a script behind it where you're talking about the day in the life for different stakeholders. And if your product has different usage paradigms, you may have to think about that. Well, the engineer is going to be in a command line. These are the things they need to see, but the administrators or the people who do integration to see this, whatever. Um, but if you've got to do a deep dive workshop, like covering your architecture, your integration, how the product is set up and, and, and uh, configured, um, if, if, you, if, if there's model training or whatever, like there may be a special workshop for that. Why? Because different people care about that aspect of the product than the people who may be depending upon it and using it uh, all day long. Uh, and I'm going to come back to trials in a minute. But so similarly to the um, the kind of my opinion of what is what is a well structured sort of first meeting, I propose this uh, approach as well. Right, a three part kind of uh, demo. I put 45 minutes, but sometimes the product demos need to be deeper based upon the depth and breadth of the product offering and maybe the audience that you have. One thing that I do know is that when you set up a demo as a result of sort of a prep call and other stakeholders will arrive, chances are high that the stakeholders that are now on this demo are people you've not met before. Hopefully you've had a chance to have a five or 10 minute prep session with the, the key coordinator of the meeting, maybe your champion, so you know who they are, but it's always good to use the first 10 minutes to learn who are the new people, what are their jobs, what are their interest areas, and what are some of the challenges that they may be grappling with. You may not get to all of that, but if you can at least know who they are 
and you can you sort of do a mental map about the stuff that they're going to care about, that's better than, than nothing. And then you also need, need to recap. Hey, look, so thanks for all for joining. We've had a couple of sessions just to recap everybody who's who's new to the conversation. Here's kind of where we're at. And then you lay out the, de the demo. I'm a big believer, you, uh, the, the, the breadcrumb, like here, it says number four, demoing to win. I kind of laid out the, the five topic areas and I want to make sure that everybody knows that that's my example of a breadcrumb. It's kind of cheesy, but but you know it, it suffices to at least let you know, okay, we're on four of, of five now, right? Similarly, I could envision a slide for a demo that says, look, we're going to show you three key aspects of our product. Part one, we're going to spend 10 minutes on in terms of blah, 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 user experience. Uh, part two, we're going to talk into configuration and part three, whatever, right? And then give them that trail of breadcrumbs. And then it's a good excuse to sort of pause, go back. Okay, let's summarize part one. Here are the key things that we talked about. Any questions, pulls the audience in. And I like that because A, it provides a break, a visual break, and it provides a breathing space for the participants. Oh, okay, now I, let me absorb that because I just gave them a small 10 minute chunk of info, a chance to converse about it and then sort of move on to the next one. So, and then the last piece of course is sort of wrap up and uh, you know question answering. This is an important one to leave time for because you might come up that, that it turns out that there are a lot of questions about your integration, right? Or, or uh, you know, API support or whatever it might be. And you want to carve out some time for that, but then you can go, well, who are the most relevant people that we've got to talk to about that? Like, you know, let, let's get their names and let's set up that next meeting. Um, now all of a sudden, what are you doing? You're expanding your org visibility even further. So giving them too much too soon minimizes your ability to do that, but compartmentalizing it maximizes uh, your ability to do that. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned that I was going to talk about trials. Uh, I, I don't know if there's an easy way to do a poll here. I don't think there is, but I'm curious to know how many people use trials as part of their sales cycle. And um, I think that they can be very impactful, but not always. I have some suggestions about where the way to think about how to use trials, or maybe a better way to say it, whether we use trials at all. Um, so the way I think about it is, first of all, is the deal size you know, uh, worth the resource investment because trials require a resource investment internally, obviously externally as well, but we've got to watch our you know, our money. Like somebody in the registration asked about the question, like, is it worth spending the money to do the deep dive demos and trials if the deal size is tiny? No, it's <laughs> short answer. But it might turn out that um, there's aspects of your product that put you ahead of your competition, right? Assuming you have competition in a given space. Uh, so question number one is, if I put my customers on my product in, you know, in, in their world, on the, in their sort of, in their data, does it help us expand our access to people and accelerate deals? If the answer is yes, that's a good thing. I love this next one. Does our software go live compared to other approaches? Meaning, can somebody just set it up and go, right? Without a lot of backend integration and all this other stuff. If the answer is yes, then that's a good, that's an advantage. One of the companies I worked with a couple of years ago, their main competition took three to four months to implement. They had a product that could go live in an afternoon. So we started using trials and it was a huge game changer because customers could prove in a week or two that they could get vast improvements over the, the current incumbent tool. And it made switching a lot easier, especially because it also realized that, oh, you're already live if you decide to sign this contract. So um, similarly, can they use the product and get value and sort of internalize it very quickly within a you know, few days or weeks? And this is this la this fourth one is a lot of times people don't think about it. Sometimes people make products whose secret sauce isn't visible in the UI. It's all the calculations and data prep and whatever that happens upstream, and then you just see the results and reports. That's not that doesn't lend itself to a trial, um, but it may lend itself to other ways of proving value. And we can we can talk a little bit more about that um, if we have if we have time. Um, so anyway, long story short, if you do decide that you want to do a trial, um, I think you can make the decision on a case by case basis, but fundamentally, if you have these advantages more often than not, it'll set you up and believe it or not, enterprises do trials. There may be some contractual 
leaps you got to make, but fundamentally they, they will do trials and they like trials that don't have a lot of heavy lift either. So if you have these advantages, they may, they may warm up to it and again, get you access to other people. So first and foremost, qualify. Don't jump to a trial after meeting one. You need to know that they're going to take action. You need to know that they're going to take action soon, that you're truly and honestly and you know in the running, that you're being considered and you're working with the right people. If all of those are true, then go for it. But I also recommend that we think about trials in terms of business outcomes, but not in terms of anything other than do we have product capabilities that they can make a very clear, logical leap show them that we can address this outcome, right? So, you know, if if I'm using Gong or some call recording software and I say, you know, if I'm if that's the product I'm selling and I can say, look, I can serve as action items in five minutes instead of having to troll through notes, that's a product capability I can show that maps directly to an outcome of better follow-up. Just a cheesy example, but I think a relevant one. So I think it's important that we do that. And I also think it's very important that if we do do a trial, we have a point of view. We have a layout that says, look, here's how we do trials. We do a million of them. Okay, obviously you don't, but <laughs> you want to look like you've done these before. You know how they go. You laid down the rails. You're getting their commitment from their people. You're getting commitment to join meetings you're going to prepare messages and sort of decks and summaries and analytics. You're going to meet regularly. You're going to surface through a joint Slack channel, any issues, and you're going to pre-agree on the things that you're going to do after you wrap up the trial. And if you can do all those things in, in, a, in a very, like you probably do in one meeting, um, then I think it makes sense to use trials because they can be a very effective deal accelerator and a way of expanding access to sort of the key people that that you would need to sell to. So question from um from the audience. Um yeah. can you talk more about use cases that don't work well for traditional trials? Good question. Um I guess um uh, if the tool you're selling and again I'm just thinking out loud I, I have to I may I may change my mind but one thing that jumps to mind is if your product is sort of not a quote unquote whole solution, meaning it's it's part of a bigger stack or it's part of a bigger offering and there's some downstream and upstream dependencies, like let's say they put your tool in, but then they also have to do these other five things with BI and reporting or with data integrate or something that doesn't allow them to do it within a reasonable time constraint that you can control then maybe that's not a good uh, candidate for a trial. So that's one example I could think of. And, and more broad, and I would say broadly, more broadly speaking, like if you go back to, you know, um, uh, trials where, well, we have to integrate with this data source. We have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do that. And then the enterprise says, oh yeah, I need, I, I might as well just buy you because I have to do all these other agreements and approvals and sign-offs just to get you in the door. That may have, that may be okay, but then maybe you turn it into almost like a paid pilot with some like 60 or 90 day out clause uh, so that they can get the resources aligned. So that's, in other words, it might change from trial to, you know, a much more, almost like a mini implementation. So I'm just thinking out loud, those are some, some examples. I'm, I'm happy to kind of continue that conversation with whoever um, asked the question, but um, those are some that come to mind. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, just to wrap up, so we have a little time to sort of chat about other questions. Um, when I say be enterprise ready, I think the theme, I'm gonna put a lot of data on here. So uh, kind of to preface it before I do that, I think um, there's a level of readiness from an assets perspective, which, you know, when I say asset, I mean, a SOC 2 document, I mean an implementation checklist, I mean integration documents or API documentations or specs or whatever. Those are assets, but a demo script is also an asset, but uh, a almost like a prep, you know, doing the prep work is also uh, sort of an asset. And so there's a level of rigor and then there's a level of assets that you have to be ready for. And I think the way to think about it is from the early, by the way, these stages stage of the sales cycle are indicative. You can use whatever sales cycle stages you have, 
But in the early stages, when you're still qualifying, is this a prospect I want to work with? We need to know upfront, what industry sector are they in? Um, what are the realities of how companies in that sector organize their engineering or tech functions? Um, who are the people I'm dealing with in the initial level? And can I, we've already talked about this in the other context, but can I, can I assess and find names that fit into the other more senior roles so I can start to build a view of, of the potential that this company uh, represents, both in terms of revenue, but how long is the sales cycle going to be? Because I'm dealing with somebody maybe too junior or what have you, right? Um, but I want to also surface issues that might have industry-specific constraints, like are they likely to ask me questions about how I handle PHI? Um, cause I don't know, I don't have an opinion on that yet. Cause I'm too new as a company. Maybe I, uh, maybe I should sort of self-qualify out of those, by the way, I'm not saying you do that, but I'm just saying that that's going to come up if it's a company that deals with, uh, protected health information as one example. Right. Um, and as we build the, the, the opportunity out, um, we'll have to be ready and, and alive to the fact that Enterprises want stuff custom to the way they do things. So they will make asks of us as we start to build that relationship of, hey, can you change how you do X or Y or Z? Um, sorry, my timer just went off. That's annoying. Um, and then also uh, they're gonna ask questions about uh, compliance regimes and, and how you support uh, data privacy and data protection. Uh, standards and that sort of thing. They're also going to be asking you questions about how you price and how you package uh, your product and how they can start to buy and extend their use of your tool over, over time. So having that kind of fleshed out is going to be very important. And also being able to talk about your product in terms of this total cost of ownership so that you can articulate what I like to call a, a believable return on the investment. So because you're going to have to have those conversations to be able to get the deal over the line with respect to the people who have control over the purse strings, right? Uh, and then as you start to build into the later stages of the sales cycle, anticipate multi-layered approval processes. They're going to have spend thresholds that are pretty rigid. And if you've got a senior exec stakeholder who really likes your product and he or she wants to get you in, but they're not clear on what those are, you're gonna to have to help them figure out how to answer those questions, right? Uh, a big area I advise companies on is the roadmap and the clarity with which you describe how you see your space and your product evolving over time. Everything in a large enterprise is about risk and risk mitigation. So they're gonna to wanna to know that you have their back for the long haul if, if they are to go ahead with you guys in, in, you know, in that context. Um, so I won't talk about the rest of this in, in terms of just because of the time, but, uh, and I think you guys can get a copy of these slides, but as you can sort of see, a lot of them are laying the tracks for the next stage of the sales cycle. Like if you're earlier and they're going to, they're going to need to implement you start to be proactive about telling them how to implement what, before they ask, because if you do it, every time you do that, you're lowering their risk. Okay. These guys know what they're doing. They've been there before. Good, they're answering my questions. So it's all about that, that reducing of that risk profile. And one tip I'll leave you with, a lot of founders I know work with legal firms that help them do their fundraising and all the documents are involved with that. They don't always translate into good commercial lawyers that know how to do transactions, right? Fast turnaround contract transactions. Oh, you get an MSA from a big enterprise. You don't want to sit on that for three weeks. You want to turn it around in a day. Right. So these are things that uh, may not occur to you on day one, but if you can find somebody that can, that knows how to do that really well, uh, I think it's very critical. Uh, and then the last piece I'll lend, lend with is it doesn't end when you sign them. You've got to have a really clear and unambiguous way of getting them live, but then also uh, sort of advocating for yourselves once they are live so that you can continue to retain them as a customer, ideally expand them as well. Um, and that is it. I will stop talking now. So let me stop, stop sharing and see if there's any questions that, uh, that have come up that, um, that, uh, we can talk.
about? Yeah, we definitely have some questions. I'd say the oh. number one thing I saw in the chat is, um, you know, will we be posting the slides? Because I know there was so much information on them. Um, and will we be posting the recording? Um, so if you want it right away, the recording should be on our YouTube, hopefully by end of week. And the slides should be on our playbooks page, hopefully by end of next week. So if you go mm -hmm. to our workbench website, uh, you can find both our playbooks page and our YouTube links there. Um, yeah, so if you if you missed anything or didn't get to screenshot a page of Kieran's or something, don't worry, you still have a second chance to get it. Um, but yeah, we have a few more questions in the chat. Let me just dig through some good ones. Yeah, let's talk the the last one that just came up. If you don't have them, um, it's likely. Well, I guess the question is, how do you handle data? How do you, you know, what are the what are the the infosec and uh, you know data protection? that uh, that you're going to run into. And I can't give you a, a, a very good answer on when you need to do that, how much you need to invest in it. But I would say as as you are starting to talk to these prospects to get a handle on what they will require and when. A lot of time you'll get some you'll get a little bit of runway if if the product you have is something they really need. And by the way, if the others have on this call have a better answer than that, please, you know, by all means, uh, share your your thoughts. Because I know it's a costly kind of um, uh, you're a, co a costly kind of endeavor to do. Um, and with respect to the urgency, I, I, I was working with a founder recently, in fact, a couple of days ago, that had a, a kind of a new way to do uh, something specific, and it was a pretty technical tool. I won't go into detail, but it was one of those things that when prospects see it, they're like, I didn't know such a thing exists. And so many times you will run into stakeholders who go, yeah, this isn't a high priority for us because we surveyed the market. We just didn't see any tools out there, right? Uh, so we don't, you know, it's not a priority for us. But now all of a sudden you're showing them what I like to call the art of the possible. Like, oh shoot, I didn't even know tools existed that could do this. Guess what? You might have helped them bump something up the priority list several notches because you've now helped them solve a problem they thought was just intransigent. They were stuck with it. And they were going to limp along with a current situation, which stinks because they couldn't find a better alternative. So that's where you get to the kind of the core of the pain. Um, and, and I have seen it time and time again that sellers and founders who are selling can amplify urgency if they're really good at painting that art of the possible. Um, question on NRE spend. So when a lot of companies, uh, I've worked for some where we had to do a lot of what I'll call NRE, I would also call professional services in, a, in another capacity, because maybe it's not engineers doing the work, but maybe it's uh, sort of uh, PS engineers or whatever. But either way, uh, it's pretty common because companies that buy software sometimes need to have it wired into their individual specific tech stack. Sometimes there's um, custom data integrations that have to be done. Sometimes the product needs the output of data from a, a customer service provider or from a, a finance platform, an ERP that then has to run through models and run calculations. All of that has to be set up. So if, if your product requires that, it's really important to have a frame of mind around how you handle that integration what you do, what they do, how long it will take, what are the risks and dependencies. And if you can document it in the form of a statement of work, you're gonna come across as much more professional to that enterprise uh, because they'll be like, they're used to SR, they're used, they're used to statements of work. So yeah, NRE, um, the term is non-recurring engineering. So it's just, uh, so you know, not a network reliability engine. Non-recurring engineering means I need your people to do some specific work for me, the customer, so I can make use of your product. So a lot of companies think of it as professional services implementation, or they built it in such a way that a third party can do the work, like Deloitte or somebody else. But if it's your engineers only doing it, then it's usually categorized as NRA. But not everybody needs that, right? And, and if, if, you have, if you sell a product that can be implemented entirely by the customer, implemented entirely just by you know configuring within a UI or even with code, but that they don't need your resources. That's not something you have to charge for. 
some companies choose to charge for it because, or some companies choose to not charge for it because they just want to take the burden off the customer. And in the early days of your company, you may choose to do that. But then at some point, documenting what the things are, like after you give them the CD, I know you're not giving them CDs, but you know, give them the software, but before they're using it live in production, there's, a, there's something between there. Well, what is it? What steps have to happen? How can you describe them in a way that a customer can do them? Or if you, you're gonna do them, can you do them in a way that is not dependent on one or two of your best engineers, but more uh, democratized in terms of the work and then eventually doable by third parties? Yeah, and Karen, um, I think I might make this the last question. It's also pretty timely just given the market and you know the state of tech layoffs and, and that sort of thing. But someone asked, how do you handle if a major stakeholder, especially if they're super senior or positive, ends up switching roles throughout the sales cycle? And I would actually piggyback off of that between switching roles, getting laid off, leaving the company, like what happens if your stakeholder is no, no longer there for you? <laughs> Yeah, it's extremely common. I've, I've suffered through that many, many times. In some cases, end up losing the deal. In some cases, been able to to, to save it. But the the number one thing to to provide a level of insurance against that is to build multiple stakeholder relationships as early as possible in the sales cycle. And going back to something I said at the beginning, and that is when we get the meeting on the books and we've done enough good homework on mapping out who are the key buyers that we likely will have to engage with. And we found ways and multiple paths to get in front of them early on. Because once you start working with one or two people and you've gone in five, six, seven meetings, they're going to want to kind of keep their arms around things and, and they're less willing to sort of get you around. And, and that's a challenge unless they're a real champion. So doing it early as, you know, way earlier than you might've even thought is going to be the best uh, sort of preventative medicine on that because yeah. that's that's a common. That's just very common. Yeah, we um had a meetup uh, maybe a few months ago with Eleanor. Um, the mm. last is uh, escaping me right now, but she's the head of sales at Retool, and she talked about multi-threading. Um, so I just dropped a link in the chat for anyone who oh, wants excellent. to look at that interview. Um, but I think that's that pretty much covers everything we had for our audience today. Um, Kieran, I kind of signed you up to do a LinkedIn post later with that G sheet you mentioned, which we can connect about offline later. Yeah. Um, right. But for anyone who still has questions or is you know still looking for more information, again, all of this is going to be pushed, put on our website. The recording will be on our YouTube and then the slides will be on our um playbook page. So you can find it all on our website. And again, at Workbench, we invest in founders at the earliest stages in the enterprise. So if you are pre-seed or even just thinking of an idea right now, definitely reach out to us. Um, and then if you're looking for more tactical content, check out our blog and of course, reach Kieran at his LinkedIn. But I think um, that's it for today. Thank you all so much. It was a, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.